Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, July 7th, 2022, and today we are going to be taking a look at the Rust Belt for the 2022 midterm elections, more specifically focused on the governor elections in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and the state of Ohio. Now, from the title of this video, I'm sure you know that we are talking about how the Democratic Party has solidified or at least been in a good point in all of these races. Now, that's not necessarily true for the state of Ohio, but it's a state that I really don't think is going to be dominating much of our discussion in this video today. Mike DeWine is the incumbent in the state of Ohio. He's been popular. He won in a blue wave year. And Ohio isn't exactly a state that I would determine to be as close or as much of a swing state as we would expect Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin have gone back and forth, and so has Ohio. But more recently, Ohio has definitely taken a much more rightward step, voting for President Trump by eight points twice, really only only shifting for the Senate election in 2018 than voting for Republicans on the House and governor level in 2018 as well. And what we're seeing from Ohio is that it's not really this close and competitive state that it used to be. And we find that Mike DeWine has practically been assured re-election since 2018. So Mike DeWine is a 99% chance of winning. This is the most we're going to talk about Ohio in this video, but I'm more focused on the blue wall, the blue wall of the Rust Belt that has held up the Democratic Party's victories in presidential elections for decades upon decades. And the blue wall, if you don't know entirely what that is, it's Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, the three states that the Republican Party had been unable to crack since 1988, had gone to every single Democratic contender, winner or loser, until the 2016 presidential election. Take a look at these three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, as we go back in time, 2012, likely blue, 2008, one safe blue, two likely blue. 2004, an election year in which you saw George W. Bush win 286 electoral votes, won the popular vote by three points, flipped Virginia, or won Virginia, won Colorado, won New Mexico, won Nevada. I'm pointing out those states in specific because Hillary Clinton won them in 2016. Yet the blue wall, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, refused to go to George W. Bush. 2000, Al Gore's loss. Republicans won Virginia. They won Colorado. They won Nevada. They almost won Oregon. Isn't that crazy to think about? They almost won New Mexico. New Mexico and Oregon were closer than Michigan and Pennsylvania. Gore won Pennsylvania by four, Michigan by five, and yet lost New Hampshire, lost Virginia, Colorado, Nevada, all Clinton states. Just something to think about. 1996, likely blue states for Clinton. 1992, lean and two likely blue states for Clinton. You go back to 88, even then, Wisconsin still held out, despite the fact that George H.W. Bush won with 426 electoral votes. Michael Dukakis wins it by 3.6%. The last time before President Trump won these three states that Republicans had done so was in 1984, when Ronald Reagan won every single state but one and came very close in the state of Minnesota. My point is, oh, my voice just cracked tremendously there. My point is that the Rust Belt states, these blue wall states, have never really shifted away towards the Republican Party until more recently when Donald Trump won them in 2016. And since then, they've been straight on the target list for the Republican Party every single election. But the Democratic Party has lucked out and has had strong candidates, enough so to win in states that even barely voted for him, for them in the past presidential election. To put things better into context, remind yourself that Joe Biden is down 18 points nationally. The Democrats are down about two points nationally. Now, these states voted for Biden by one point in Pennsylvania, three points in Michigan, and one point in Wisconsin, meaning they should have been easy and automatic pickups for the GOP in this upcoming election. Now, there are two incumbents. Tony Evers in Wisconsin, Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan, but Pennsylvania became an open race. Again, more things indicating that these three states, ones that were won by President Trump, should be easy pickup opportunities given our national environment. But that simply is not the case. And not only are these states not easy pickup opportunities, but based off of the deluxe, classic, and light models in these three states, according to 538 and many other expert ratings, these states are at least somewhat solid for the Democratic Party. Wisconsin, the least, which is not surprising. It was the least that voted for Trump for Biden in 2020, uh, voted for Trump the most out of the three states in 2016. But they give Tony Evers, the Democrat, a 64% chance of victory in a state where not many people expect the Democratic Party to win, including myself. But I don't like to argue with forecasts or models that tend to have more reliability than many other people. I think Wisconsin's number here is something that can be argued and it can go back and forth. 
But based off of what we see, a 64% chance of victory is not at all the position that I would have expected Tony Evers to be in, even looking back at this a year ago, if I was to chance it way back then. Wisconsin is a lean D state, according to 538, and it is quite surprising, but maybe not so much, seeing the Democratic Party's quality of candidates and Republican, the Republican Party's lack of quality candidates across these three states. The next day I would point you to the, is the state of Pennsylvania, where Josh Shapiro, the attorney general of the state, has 74% in terms of a chance of victory. He is the non-incumbent. Think about this for a moment. He is winning in a state as a non-incumbent, as a Democrat, in a red wave year, in a state that Biden only won by one. If every single state was to shift the state, shift the way that Virginia did in the 2021 gubernatorial race, Pennsylvania would be a Republican pickup by over 10 points. But that isn't the case. The expectation here is that Josh Shapiro wins by five. Now, to give you a bit of background about Shapiro, he is the attorney general, won the most votes of any Pennsylvania candidate in United States history. He won over three million votes, outperformed Biden by five points on the same ballot. So Democrats were really happy with him. He cleared the field for the nomination. The, Democrat, the Pennsylvania Democratic Party immediately endorsed him and not one person contested him on the primary ballot. He ran on a post and was able to immediately shift towards the general election. Doug Mastriano, on the other hand, won the Republican nomination, but is by no means their strongest potential contender. Doug Mastriano is extreme, and that's even saying it lightly. Doug Mastriano believes that voter rolls should be cleared. He believes that many things, such as the 2020 election was rigged, believes that 2024 can't be fair if Biden wins it. It's pretty much said that he would send fair electors to, the, uh, to, uh, to vote at the Capitol to vote and cast their ballots for the actual winner. And I'm saying this in air quotes, you can't see that. The actual winner of the 2024 presidential election. I mean, what we are going to see here is that this race is going to come down to an issue of extremism, an issue about what voters want to see in their governor. And while they may be unhappy, as I'm sure many other Americans are, with Biden's performance and Biden's inability to get significant things done in their eyes, they are still likely to vote for the Democrat in this race. This is a region, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, again, to reiterate, as I will multiple times, that the GOP should have had such an easy chance at victory. They had a Republican incumbent in Wisconsin at this point. They had a Republican incumbent in Michigan at this point. And I get it. 2018 was not their year. But fast forward to 2022, when the national environment is arguably worse for the Democratic Party than it was in 2016. And yet Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania want to hold out and vote for the Democratic Party, not only just by 0.6 or 0.7, by some points, five points. And as we will see in Michigan, double digits. This is where it gets alarming for the GOP, because this blue wall had been reliable for the Democratic Party up until recently, but there's a possibility that in terms of these elections and in other elections, it might become reliable yet again. The progress that Donald Trump pushed forward to the GOP won't be walked back for decades. These states are only going to get redder, in fact. But the point is that as of right now, they seem to be holding out strong for the Democratic Party in a year where you never would have expected it. And in the last state we're going to look at amongst the three is the state of Michigan. This is a likely Dem characterization by 538. And looking at the chance of victory, along with the forecasted vote share, the Republican Party should definitely be worried. Now, they use Ryan Kelly, the candidate who was arrested by the FBI on January 6th charges, as the frontrunner. And honestly speaking, that might be true. Based off of the polls in the state of Michigan in the Republican primary, we do have a frontrunner, and that is Ryan Kelly. Now, I don't think he's the most electable. Honestly speaking, I don't think many of these people are most electable. Looking at the candidates here, if you don't know what happened in the state of Michigan, I will give you the TLDR. Essentially, there were 10 candidates. Five of them uh, employed this company to get signatures for them to get on the ballot. All they needed was 15,000. There are millions of residents in the state of Michigan. You needed 15,000 signatures. What happened was that five of these candidates actually got fraudulent signatures. The company that they went out to do fr made fraud signatures, and they thought that it would pass by the Board of Elections. Unfortunately for them, it did not. They appealed all the way up to the state Supreme Court, and they said, nope, your signatures were invalid. You didn't get them by the deadline. We're not extending it for you. You are off the ballot. And thus, they were removed. So now we're down to five practical no-name candidates, people that weren't the recognizable ones. There was a very clear frontrunner, as can be seen in this poll. And then once he was disqualified, yes, the frontrunner was disqualified. Now it becomes a multiple-way race where Ryan Kelly maintains a lead, according to Real Clear Politics, but ultimately it is pretty close at this point. So it could go either way. But based off of the expected winner and also based off the remainder of these candidates, I can't exactly say that I expect the results to be dramatically different depending on who the Republican is. 
Gretchen Whitmer has a 91% chance of victory. When she won in 2018, she was an instant target for the Republican Party. And that simply is still the case, but isn't going their way. Because their frontrunner was just arrested by the FBI, their previous frontrunners, and the three others that were leading the remaining contenders that are still in the race were all disqualified. I mean, what had happened in the state of Michigan was such a significant shakeup across the race that Whitmer now has a 91% chance of victory and a forecasted vote share of a margin of victory of 12.7%, a 13-point victory in a year that is less favorable for her than 2018. To remind you of where she was in 2018, where well, here's the thing. You look at the election results and you see that Gretchen Whitmer didn't win by 13, but in fact won by 10. If she wins this election in 2022, which I don't think will be the case, but as of right now, it looks like it might be. And looking at the shaking up of the Michigan Republican Party, it's possible that it does happen. It would have been impossible, James Craig or another Republican that was of his stature. But it seems to be something that is within the realm of possibility, at least now. But if Whitmer does better than she did in 2018, this will be a horrible look for the Republican Party. Same thing goes for Tony Evers in the state of Wisconsin. He only won by one in a blue wave year, yet is now the expected winner of the, the Michigan, uh, sorry, Wisconsin governor's race as the incumbent and with a forecasted vote share of winning by three points. Putting that back into where we were, this would be a very good showing for the Democratic Party. Now, they're not going to win in Pennsylvania by 17, as Tom Wolf did over Scott Wagner. That's not going to be the result. But we could see a victory that might become near double digits. But regardless, a victory is a victory. I was just saying how it would be impressive for the Democratic Party for them to do better in Michigan and Wisconsin in a year that is so much worse for them overall. Pennsylvania, it doesn't really show much. Tom Wolf was a very popular incumbent. Sure, you could read into it and say the Democratic margin of victory narrowed up 12 points. But at the end of the day, it does have to come down with electability, with candidate quality. And while Josh Shapiro, I think, is a strong candidate, again, these races are still competitive. Wisconsin is still within single digits. Pennsylvania is still within single digits. But the point is that across the Rust Belt, the blue wall that crumbled when President Trump won it in 2016 seems to be re-solidifying itself. When it voted for President Biden in 2020, the true test about whether or not it would stay would be 2022. And as of right now, the Pennsylvania Senate race doesn't look too bad for the Democratic Party in a race where the Republican Party has an incumbent. Now, the state of Wisconsin, I can't say it looks good for the Democratic Party. Ron Johnson, as the incumbent, is very much likely to win this race. But what I will say is that the Democratic Party is still giving him a fight for uh, a run for his money and a fight worth remembering. The margin of victory for Ron Johnson might be five points. But if you have the governor's race still going to the Democrats, Democrats solidify Michigan, solidify Pennsylvania on the Senate and governor level, it's a silver lining for the GOP at best in a year where they should be winning all five of these races. As I have been saying time and time again, the GOP did not send their best. They did not nominate their best candidates and those who would have been the best in some cases didn't even end up on the ballot or won't be on the ballot for a bunch of different reasons. The Republican Party right now, I would say, has had so many opportunities that are now missed opportunities due to who they've nominated or who they have not nominated. There are situations where looking at these races where a year ago, I would have thought the Republican Party would have had a better chance, even though a year ago, Democrats were up on the generic ballot. Biden was up in terms of approval. Everything was looking better. Gas prices were $2 less, a dollar less, depending on where you were. Things were looking on the up and up for the Democratic Party. And yet now, today, July 7th, 2022, I am more confident the Democratic Party will win in some of these races than I was a year ago. And that's where it gets shocking. That's where it gets alarming. So these Rust Belt states, I would watch them because if Democrats can hold on to them, it means that there is still Democratic support left over for 2024. Because these voters are still willing to vote for Democrats despite being angry at Biden, which in a very similar fashion to the 2012 election, when Obama was down in national approval yet still won re-election by four points on the national popular vote, won 332 electoral votes, it spells out good news. These are the states to watch in terms of electoral trends and in terms of a pushback on President Biden, or whether or not that pushback becomes seemingly non-existent across the previously crumbled blue wall. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. 
I'm not having a good day today when it comes down to voice cracks. I don't know what's going on, but there's a video recommendation on the screen. There's a playlist that you can go ahead and watch. Make sure you follow on Instagram, Twitter, and join the Discord in the bottom left corner of your screen. Again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all hopefully later today.